if you could see up here, uh, you would recognize that I have a dent in my forehead. Look real clear, close. This is the power of suggestion. You're supposed to say, yes, damn, I see it. Yes, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, 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 yeah right, 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 right. Um, now, that dent is there for a reason that I'll explain in just a second. But this is not the first time I've had a dent in my forehead. Uh, uh, my first dent in my forehead started when I was about 13. 13 through about 20 or 21 or 22. And the conversation at home would be something like this. Tim, why are you doing that? Duh, I don't know. Tim, where are you going? Duh, I don't know. What in the world were you thinking? Duh, I don't know. And so I pretty much walked around my whole teenage years with a permanent dent in my forehead, sort of softened my skull a little bit. And then after that, I became incredibly wise. <laughs> and then I decided that, that I was far more brilliant than my parents ever could have dreamed I was, or that they actually were. And uh, there really wasn't anybody else on the planet that was nearly as smart as I was. Maybe a couple of guys, but I didn't really know them. And so, so I set out to do life in a particular way. And my motivation during that time was there were things that I wanted in life and I was going to get them. And, and there were particular ways that I had figured out how you could do that. Some of that involved manipulation and so on. Some of you, I, I know not many, but some of you had that same season in your life where you sort of pretty much figured you were smarter than everybody else on the planet and you started doing life in a particular way. You did relationships in a particular way. You went about getting the things in life that you think you deserve in a particular way. And somewhere, hopefully around about 30 or a little into your 30s, this happened. I can't believe I did that. What have I been doing for the last 10 years? And suddenly you figured out that maybe you aren't as brilliant as you thought you were. And just maybe some of the things that you had adopted that other people had told you were the way to do life. <laughs> I'm laughing because of the list of things that I found out that I did wrong and did poorly is, is, is pretty long. But, but you, you started doing one of these because you realized you just didn't have it together. And I understand that I'm describing an experience that a lot of people have. Now, maybe I've got the, the years off a little bit, but sooner or later, all of a sudden, things start happening that show you that you're not as wise as what you think you are. And some of the things are about simple things in life, and some of them are about deeply serious things in life. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for some of us, we actually thought, and my, I, I jokingly like to say that there are times when, uh, in our lives when we think that we're the king of our world, and all of you are the subjects in my world, and you're supposed to all cooperate with the way I do life. Have you noticed that never works out? because someone's more than happy to inform you that you are not the king of your world and the world does not revolve around you. Well, so those, the, for that reason, I had a lot of dents in my head, forehead over the years. But in this last series that Randy has been doing for us uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, I've had another one of those moments this week. Now, if you haven't figured out, Randy's not going to be here this morning because he's not feeling well. So uh, that's bad news for him and bad news for you because you got me this morning. <laughs> and, um, but, but, but as I started thinking about this series just this week, even before I uh, found out that I was going to be speaking, I, I had one of those moments where I went, ah. and this is what I started thinking. Has anybody else recognized that there's a lot of heavy stuff in the book that some of this talk about the hard things in life is pretty hard to hear. Is it, has anybody else thought that at all, that this has been kind of... I mean, Randy's done a great job, 
But I mean, just the, the weightiness of all of this is pretty, pretty difficult. And then, of course, it began, I began to start recounting the things. I'm not going to go into them right now, but there are some pretty heavy things happening in and around my life and, and, and the people that are involved in my relationships. And so, frankly, many of the things that I've been hearing Randy talk about have been very present, very real. It has, again, reminded me about the amazing ability of the words that God chose to put down in Scripture, how applicable, how real they are for today's life, right? It's true. And so I've had another one of those, duh, this is really hard stuff kind of a moment. And even had to admit, as I thought about some of the more difficult matters that I've found myself dealing with, do you know there are times when it's pretty easy for a person to lose their faith? Would you agree with me? I'm not saying you have, but ha haven't you felt pretty overwhelmed before with what seems to be a never-ending list of things that are so incredibly difficult that you just want to say, hey, forget this. And so this morning, no, I'm not teaching directly from the series, but frankly, I wanted to come with you and have you think with me about this series in light of how we, how we receive this very, some of it very difficult teaching, some of it very difficult to receive. And, and, and even as we've understood the truths of it, there's another place in the Bible where we're warned because it's possible for a person not to combine what they know to be true with a thing called faith. And so uh, we, we don't have a slide. We don't have slides this morning. A few of the scriptures the uh, folks upstairs will help you get with. They don't have this particular one. But I'll just read from you for the book of Hebrews chapter 4. He says this, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found short, having fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did, and the they he's referring to uh, were the Israelites, because he's just been talking about how they did not enter the rest of God, even though God said he was going to provide them this amazing place of promise and rest to live in. He says, just like them, we've had the gospel, the good news preached to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value with them. Listen to why. Because those who heard did not combine it with faith. I'm going to read that passage just one more time again. For we've heard the gospel preached to us just like the Israelites did, and they didn't enter the rest. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed have entered the rest of God just like he said. So I declare on my oath, in my anger, they'll never enter the rest unless they have faith. So it made me thinking about this incredible amount of excellent, meaty teaching Randy's been sharing with us of the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and I, I suddenly realized, in view of all the things that I'm experiencing right now, the warning was to all believers that it's possible to hear the truth God can pour out literally a feast in front of you of life and the way to do life, and he is the way to do life. But if I do not combine it with my faith, I don't get to enter the rest that he intended for me. And you know what? I don't want that. I want the rest that he gives. And so just one more uh, part of this passage in chapter 4 I point to is this. <clears throat> He says in the beginning, this is 4.14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Again, hang on to our faith, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without a sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 
So as I considered this, there's a couple of ways. And, and by the way, uh, some of you that have been in my second hour class or something like may have heard uh, some pieces of what we're going to talk about today, but uh, to, to be quite frank with you, I'm, I'm okay with that because even I forgot these truths that I'm going to share with you in the past weeks when there's been very difficult things coming. And I want to be encouragement to you because I do not want you to lose your faith when you know the things that are true. Fair enough? There are a couple of reasons people lose their faith. One of them is that I make a decision about a change in my lifestyle. Now, there may be other, other lists, things on the list of people losing their faith. These are categories of things. The first category of things is, is that people lose their faith because they make a lifestyle decision that is contrary to the way they've been believing they should do life. Now, frankly, there may be some people here who uh, haven't yet made a decision to follow Christ. Indeed, there may be some people here that actually follow another religion or faith. But do you know the same thing is true for you too? One of the things that can change our, the basis of our faith is that we make a lifestyle decision and it doesn't fit with what we've bought into before. And it may be that our parents taught us that. It may be that we made a choice for that for ourselves. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. But, um, uh, so we find ourselves in this place where I'm choosing a particular lifestyle, a way to do things, but it doesn't fit with what I believe, so I start changing my faith, the way I do things. And so here would be a couple of really simple examples. I could give you dozens of them. One is, is I may have a belief system, uh, have grown up with a belief system. I may indeed have, for instance, chosen Christ, and he says that I'm to serve people and that I'm not to be deceitful. And so as I grow up, I get through school, high school, maybe college, and I head into the work world, I get into a system that actually rewards me for being deceitful. Or I discover if I really want to get ahead, I have to be just a little manipulative and deceitful. Now, if I did a poll this morning, there'd be nobody in here to say, well, yeah, it's a real good thing to just kind of do things on the shady, uh, you know, do a little things a little, a little side on the shady, right? Nobody would agree to that. But the truth is, is if, if I get into a system, if I make a lifestyle decision that says, it's okay for me to fudge on these things over here. Here's my excuse for not doing it the way I have believed. Here's what will happen. I will find myself justifying why, if I'm a Christ follower, why the Scriptures don't teach what the Scriptures say, or I will find myself going through a series of logical reasons that you say, well, given the situation, that way of doing life just doesn't work anymore. Are you following what I'm saying? So I actually have a shift in my belief system because I make a lifestyle change. Now... <clears throat> I would tell you I went through that, maybe more than once. But I made decisions, particularly as I was getting out of high school and, and for the next few years, where I made some lifestyle decisions. And, and while I was doing that, I was abandoning some of the faith, not all of my faith. I certainly wouldn't have said that, well, I've rejected Christ. Because, see, that sounds really nice. If I say I haven't rejected Christ, I'm just abandoning pieces of it. And this is one of the dangers. People like to sue, self-sue by saying, well, I still believe in Jesus, but they allow a lifestyle change to influence how they believe something. Is this, are you, you tracking with me so far? Now, whether this is about what kind of lifestyle I'm going to live in terms of marriage or singleness or something like that, certainly that can be a part of it. But it can be a myriad of other things. It can be, it can be that I, you know, that whole thing I was mentioning before, that I think I'm the king of my castle and, and that everybody else is my subject and everybody ought to live based on what I want. And it doesn't really matter what everybody else wants. Well, you see, I can make a lifestyle change like that, but I have to know her. I just have to walk over a bunch of things that Jesus himself talked about, right? Like love others as you'd like to be loved and so on and so forth. Like the week you go on. So, so understand that one of the reasons we lose our faith is because we make a lifestyle change. And then we have to adjust our life to fit the lifestyle change. So for those of you that might be here, and if by the end of the teaching day you go, you know what, I have personally made a faith change. There's been a change in my faith, and particularly it, the, the great majority of you in here are Christ followers. If you actually, you're not going to admit it to me today, 
But if you actually say, you know what, there's some things that I know there are people who value what the Scripture teaches, and they're telling me that the choices I'm making are against what Scripture teaches. You might want to consider that you may be one of those people, just like I have been before, that has made a change in their faith because they've made a lifestyle change about the way they're doing things. And if you're one of those people, here's a simple message I have for you this morning. I don't know who you are. I don't want to know who you are. But if you're one of those people, here's something I'd invite you to do. Christ has an amazing thing he does, particularly with the person who has said, I want to follow Christ. He will not let sin stand in your life indefinitely without bringing a challenge to it. And one of the ways, big ways as he challenges it, is he just takes his hands off and lets you do whatever you want to do. And sometime along the way, even though there may be plenty of people who have been challenging you and saying you, you know, this is not a good idea, somewhere along the way, maybe a few years from now, you're going to say this. You know, that wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. I can't believe I did that. And when that moment happens, do not do what some people do. They are so determined not to admit that they've made a mistake. They're so determined to keep it from admitting that they have sinned that they'll just go on like the thing they're doing is okay. In other words, I'm going to hang on to this God no matter what, and you can have it, but you've got to pry it out of my cold, dead hand first. You see, if we've had a faith loss because we made a lifestyle change, the dilemma is, is that I may want to just stay in that because I don't want to admit it to anybody. And I'm pleading with you, no matter how young or how old you are, if what you've learned from the suffering that you're either experiencing now because of those choices or in the, in the future, you figure out, this has not gone well, this is not the way. I plead with you to say, Jesus, this is me, and I was wrong. And I come to you to fall on your grace and your mercy. Because that's exactly what the Hebrew writer says. I pray that we could enter boldly to the Heavenly Father and experience His grace and His mercy relative to all the things of our life, which includes the times when we made a lifestyle change and lost faith. You see, Christ will actually use that suffering that comes from your choosing to bring you back to a place of faith, but you still get to choose. Several years back, I had a fellow who was married, and... Uh, he basically was the biggest bully I ever met. This is many, many years ago, actually. This is over a decade ago. He was the biggest bully I'd ever met. <clears throat> In the middle of all that, he finally admitted that perhaps he'd created a lot of anger in his wife and his children because he was a big bully. And I can remember saying to him, you know, praise God. Isn't it amazing how God can bring us a revelation when we're just dumb as a rock? And I meant it. I mean, I wasn't even trying to be disrespectful to the guy. I was really excited the guy had admitted. And then he looked at me and he says, I'll never yield to that. Because nobody's going to tell me what to do. You see, he recognized and admitted that he created incredible chaos in his family, but he was unwilling to yield to it. The person who does that, rather than going to the presence of Christ, runs away from the presence of Christ, and His mercy and grace wants to put you back in the way and the thing that satisfies you and gives you a place of rest, like it says in the book of Hebrews. But if you will not yield by admitting to that, and you will not yield by allowing Him to literally be the Lord of your life to define for you what the next move is and the next move, you will spend the rest of your life in misery. Jesus Christ loves you desperately, and especially as a believer. He wants to bring you to a place of rest and peace in this life. But if you choose a lifestyle change and lose your faith, it's a problem. And you can be one of those people who never enter into the rest of God. 
The second reason people lose faith, and again, in view of all of this, and I've been hitting my head going, I can't believe, how could I possibly feel so overwhelmed that I just want to blow off the whole thing and, and maybe lose faith? <clears throat> Excuse me, there's a second reason we use faith, lose faith, and it's when, as a believer, if it's not a lifestyle change, it's because things do not go the way that I had hoped that they were going to go. And certainly Randy's been unpacking this in a very big way. In other words, the events in life that I thought were going to be mine, perhaps my hopes and dreams, perhaps relative to my health, and there's a, we have a lot of folks that are struggling with a lot of health issues right now, and they are hoping for a different outcome, not just them, but all of us, are hoping for a different outcome. It may be that you are a parent here this morning, and things are happening with your kids, and you're just going, really? All I've invested in them, all I've cared about them for, it, really, this, this is what they're going to choose at this particular point in life? It may, that you have, it may be that you have friends and you, you are blown away that they could choose the kinds of things that they're choosing. And you are so discouraged because perhaps, as Randy were talking about the other day, you have prayed and it doesn't appear that God's, God's even hearing, much less answering any of your prayers. I want to give you an encouraging word this morning because... Christ is the man, is the one who delivers us into this place of rest. But I want to give you a place of encouragement just very quickly this morning about when we are at a place where things are not working out the way we appear that they are, and I feel myself having my faith slip away from me. I want to give you four very specific things that are explanations and very real truths about what's going on. Now, I do not presume to know the God, mind of God, but I certainly can look at the Scriptures and see how God's working. So when you're wondering about being delivered from the trouble you're in, when you feel your faith slipping away, I want you to understand some things about the way that God works. Here's first of all, that sometimes the deliverance of God becomes before, for some people, comes before they ever get in trouble. I would point you out, point out to you, to the Israelites in Exodus chapter 14, verse 4. He says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to die? Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through is what God told Moses. I would suggest to you that sometimes we see people delivered completely out of the trouble before the trouble ever happens. How many of you have seen people completely, not even just the whole thing gets stopped before it ever started? Maybe it happened in your own life. I have. I've seen that happen. I've had it happen in my own life, and I've seen it happen in other people's lives. There's a reason why that happens, and I'm just going to suggest a few of them to you. First of all, God says very clearly in this, I'm, fa I'm hardening Pharaoh's heart because I'm going to make people sure that people discover that I am the source of life. God delivers us before the trouble even comes. Frankly, even when I don't have faith, because the Israelites at this particular time, they were not great people of faith. You do get that, right? They were not saying, oh, praise the Lord, oh, God Almighty. No, they were saying, why in the world did you take us out of bondage? We were better off back there. So this has nothing to do with the level of faith you have, but indeed, it has to do with these two, th two or three things. First of all, there are times in my life when I am too weak in my faith to make it through if I go through that trouble, and God's going to deliver me beforehand. There are times when I have no defense for the thing that is coming, and God knows that, and he stops it from coming. God knows and stops all things which destroy his purposes. So the first reason that it appears that sometimes some people pray and have something not even be an impact on their life at all is because at this particular point in their life, 
That's precisely what God has determined they need. So sometimes God delivers before the trouble. Secondly, God delivers sometimes when we're in the trouble. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, <clears throat> beginning in verse 7, going through verse uh, 10, it says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. And three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insult and in hardship and persecution and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. You need to recognize that sometimes God actually delivers you in the middle of your trouble. Now, granted, I'm not liking that he's doing it. And granted, it may not be what I was praying for. I was praying, could I do the before thing? But, but I'm, I'm trying to give you a sense of understanding that God does things at particular points in our life because of what our need was. At this particular point in the Apostle Paul's life, the guy was full of himself. He was incredibly boastful and proud. You get that, right? Or at least there was a potential of him becoming that way because he'd been caught up to the third heaven and seen these great revelations. When I'm being delivered <clears throat> in the middle of the trouble, when I'm being delivered in the middle of the trouble, it's going to be difficult. I won't like it. It may never go away. But here's the important thing. God knows at that particular moment that I need something more than the healing or the being delivered from the circumstance that I'm in. And it's that I am potentially becoming a threat to myself and what he's doing in my life by becoming boastful and proud. And so God says to Paul, this is the only thing you're going to get. My grace is going to take care of the fact that you're so weak and I'll demonstrate my power in you and your weakness. Now, guess what? You don't get to, like, have a debate with God about when you're too proud or not too proud. Or there's the potential of you becoming boastful and proud. God is in charge of that. And so there are some times when you have found yourself praying and you've said, God, I want out of this thing. And he says, no, you're going to be in it. And in the middle of it, I will give you what you need for this thing and then the next step and the next step and the next step. My favorite passage, probably becoming in the whole Scripture, I've said it dozens of times here, it's the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings. They'll run and not grow weary, and they'll walk and not faint. The walking and not faint is making it too. And it's God's grace that is holding me together. Sometimes God answers our prayers, but he does not deliver us out of the trouble. He delivers us in it. The third thing we recognize when there's trouble and I'm praying that it be gone out of my life is <clears throat> sometimes I'm delivered out of the trouble. What I'm talking about here, before I, was, I talked about being delivered before. I talked about being left in trouble. And my, so my deliverance is what God gives. I discover Christ is my source, and I recognize I have nothing to give to the situation. And so God is my complete provision, even though none of the circumstances are changing. But there's this third thing that's called being delivered out of the trouble. And that means there's this, these circumstances of life happening, and you go through it, and you eventually end up out of it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he describes it like this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show, is the beginning of verse 7, to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. He says, we're hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, and we should be. I'm perplexed, I don't know, but I'm in despair. I'm persecuted, but not abandoned. I am struck down, but I am not destroyed. He says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to, my, uh, to um, death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. When I'm being delivered by going through the trouble and finally get out of it, there are several things that are true. First of all, I am giving endurance, given endurance that I do not currently have. You see, everybody wants the benefit of learning from the things of life that teach us, but nobody wants to pay the ticket to go through the things of life to learn the lesson. 
we actually, I had a fellow that came to some training about five years ago down at, at, down at the house, and he was an international, he's in from uh, New Zealand, and we went through the whole week and we were talking about this particular subject and he looked at me and he says, I completely disagree with everything you're teaching. I thought, well, that'd be about right. You're 20. <laughs> I was saying the same thing to all the people that were my age when I was 20. And I said, what particularly are you in disagreement about? He says, well, listen, he says, I'm a really smart guy. He said, literally, I have a genius IQ. Uh, and he says, if, uh, you, you do have some good teaching. And I'm going to adopt every single thing you've taught me into my life. And I'm not going to have to experience all that other stuff to go through it and then come out of it. And I said, well, you know, listen, uh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just an old boy from Tennessee, so you can't, I mean, how much can you expect? I mean, look into my accent. So, but I said, listen, it, when that happens and you recognize you've been, doing, been able to incorporate this over 60 hours of training we've put you through, I just want you to call me back up and say you're there. Well, I heard from him just last year. And a year and a half after he left me, he got married. Now, she's a fine woman. But I'm telling you, being married is no walk in the park. Just ask all the ladies. And he calls me up, and this is all he said. Now, he called me, so I didn't call. He called me up, and he says, um, you, you were right. <laughs> He's whispering to me on the phone. I said, who is this? He said, you were right. And I said, I was right about what? And he said, well, I told you that you don't have to learn the things in this life by going through them and experiencing them and have Christ prove me that his way is the only way. And that a, a part of that that's involved in that is this thing that I struggle with trusting God in the middle of my failure. And I said, well, what's happened? So he went on for about an hour to tell me about how he thought marriage, this is such a wonderful woman. But he says, you know, she doesn't take my word for anything. And I said, well, that's really a, a problem, isn't it? Because you're the wisest man I've ever met. <laughs> and he just went on and on, tell me about that none of this stuff was working out the way it is. And I said, what has it taught you? And he says, well, we're, we're out the other end of it now. But he says, this is what it's taught me. I don't know anything. And the stuff I do know, I can't even do. But he says, I have learned this. Apart from Christ, I can't do one single thing. Gee, he says, I, he says, I know everything there is to know about marriage. I've literally read now 40 books on marriage. <laughs> 40 because he was so desperate, because he thought his marriage was going to fall apart. 40 books on marriage. And he says, I actually quit preaching at the church I was at for six months because I was devastated that I've so messed up this thing called marriage. And he says, you know, I've discovered Jesus will tell me everything I need to do today for what my wife needs and he'll give me the ability to do the hard things that he calls me to. Isn't that beautiful? You see, God brings me out of trouble, and as a result, I'm given endurance I don't have. I can have an impact, impact that I did not have, and I am giving faith, given faith that I will actually need later on. And finally this, when I'm delivered... Sometimes I'm delivered after the trouble. And I'm going to point to you a very familiar passage you're familiar with, and a fellow from 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the first part of the verse, it just says, in the springtime, it's time for kings to go off the war. You've heard this passage before, and David wasn't there. In verse 51, talking about his sin with Bathsheba and killing her husband and, and uh, taking another man's wife, he says, God against you and you only I've sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite, oh God, you will not despise. You see, there are times when I'm delivered after the trouble, and just in case you're missing all of this, this is what meaning being delivered after the trouble is. I don't want you to say what it is. Have anybody, is there anybody in here that you've gotten well down the road even your young life of road, and you've gone, I can't believe I said that or did that. Anybody? Yeah. We've been there, and I'm telling you, there's more than one thing that I've thought to myself, God, 
Could you not have told me about this beforehand? Could you not have convicted me that I was headed there? Why, did, why am I just now getting this? Of course, I'd like to tell you more often than not, I figured out that the Lord did send three or four people to tell me and to give me a warning. So it wasn't even him that he didn't try, but the truth is that God could write it on a wall, right? He could appear to me in a vision, but there are times when there's some things I just will not yield to until I'm living in the middle of the insanity of what I've chosen. And that is God's deliverance at that time. I'm not saying God made me sin. I'm just saying my sin was not stronger than him. And he does this amazing things now. I'm actually delivered through my failure. I now see what I was blind to before, because if I'm blind, I can't see it, and I learned to listen when I could not. God gets to decide what the plan is. So when we're talking about this issue, and as Randy continues in this series, in Ecclesiastes, and all the trouble that happens, and, and the difficulties of living in this life, I don't want you to lose faith. I don't want you to be like me, that you're, you've got a permanent dent in your head. I want you to recognize something, that the promise given in the book of Hebrews in chapter 4 is that as a follower of Christ, I can enter with boldness with Jesus, and there's something he's promised me, and it's not deliverance from every problem I've experienced, right? It says he will give me grace and mercy for this time. I need that. I need, and as a matter of fact, if you aren't a Christ follower, you need that as well because you get to live in the same broken world that I live in, right? Now, I want uh, the worship team to come on up. We're just going to end with a crescendo of worship and prayer today. And as they're coming up, I'd, I'd finally say this to you. Even in the middle of whether or not you have found yourself that you've made a lifestyle change and you're losing your faith because you're going to stick with your lifestyle change, or, or even if you're at a place where uh, uh, you recognize you're in one of those four, the in, the out, the before, and the after, and you're saying, Tim, I don't like that not all of those. I, number three I don't like, or number two I don't like, or maybe I don't like any of them. Why can't Christ just go ahead and deliver me? Why can't he do that? Because I, I, I just, I, I recognize life is hard, but I want to go on with him. Here's the mercy of God, that he knows how much faith you have right now. And you may not even want to be doing anything with it, but he's 100% committed to move you along in your faith. Isn't that good news? Even when I don't want to have faith, when I do not like the thing that's happening and I want it out of my life, he is committed to take me along. But I don't want you to be discouraged by just wondering, well, how come that guy got delivered completely and I'm having to wait till the after until I've been embarrassed by every single thing I've done? You see, we're horrible at evaluating what God's doing. Or at least I am. I don't know about you. I look at the circumstance I find myself in and I go, God, what are you doing? I can't see the end of this thing. Here's the mercy of God. Here's the grace of God. I'll never let you go. I am going to keep bringing you along in the middle of this, and I'll accomplish exactly what needs to be accomplished to give you the place of rest. Not just in the life to come, but in this life. So I want to invite you this morning, if you've been wrongly evaluating, if you've been poorly evaluating this whole issue, if you've somehow started finding yourself losing your faith because the circumstances are happening, I plead with you. Do not try to outthink God. Do what he says in, the, in 1 Peter, finally said, and we don't have time to go into this passage, in the third passage. He says, be, be willing to give an answer. Give a reason for the faith that lies within you. And it's the things of life are coming that in the context of that passage are incredible suffering. He says... Make Jesus your Lord. Translated, Lord, I yield to your wisdom, and whatever you bring me, I receive it as through your hand. Well, that's a tall order. But if I don't, I lose my faith. Now, the worship team's going to have us sing together here in just a minute. 
and there are some people that I want to I want to lift up to you and I want to mention them now and then I want to challenge you towards something those folks that are in the middle of one of these things we've been talking about one of the, particularly one of these four areas some people with surgeries coming up Curtis Holmes and Larry Kaufman there's some people recovering Bailey Racine and Kathy Mullinex recovering from surgery some ongoing prayer needs. Richard's here with this morning. Curtis Sprinkle, Richard Snur. And then issues of cancer with Bill Stryker and Curtis Mullinex and Nancy Ridenauer. You see, I don't have to pretend like this stuff doesn't exist because these folks are living it in their physical relationship. But there's many other situations out there. There are parents out there that are completely brokenhearted right now. Because all the dreams that you thought you had are not coming true. And if you think that the only reason people suffer is because they disobey God, you're dead wrong. Because as a parent, if you haven't figured it out yet, you pour yourself in and you love them and you build a cross for them to hang you on. And I'm not complaining. It's the way the Lord designed this thing. But love puts you in a critical place with people. They have the ability to hurt you. And it's not just with kids. It's with the people in our friendships and life. But our God has mercy, and he wants to deliver us to a place of rest and stability. And finally, he says this, so that we are literally a living beacon to the world of the amazing work that this God, has, God through Jesus Christ, came to, came to reclaim in this broken world. I want to challenge you this morning. Why don't you stand with me? If you're at a place where you've been losing your faith, or maybe it's, you're just at a place you recognize you're in one of those things. I want you to say, God, I'm right there right now. And if you need some encouragement, find somebody this morning. But I want us to end with a crescendo of prayer and praise and crying out to God, Lord, it is well with my soul.